evening. Welcome to everybody attending today. My name is Karen Burghardt, and I am the Executive Director of the Colorado Springs Rural Affairs Council. We are pleased to welcome you to tonight's program, Gee Whiz, Have We Lost the Saudis to China? Let's take just a moment to thank our supporters. Thank you to the Tiemann's Foundation, and thank you to the Richard Petritz Foundation. Also, thank you to our institutional members, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, the United States Air Force Academy, Pikes Peak State College, the Colorado Springs Chamber and EDC, SEBA Charter High School, and Fountain Valley School. Before we begin, I would like to introduce you to the newest member of our team. Many of you have met Masha Popovich as you came in, but I want to take a moment to recognize her. Could you just raise your hand there? Masha is... Masha is our communications and events coordinator. And many of you have been used to contact Elise Sappington with questions about events and registration, and going forward, that person will be Masha. Elise and I are just thrilled to have her on board, so please help me to make her feel welcome. I recently had the opportunity to travel to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia along with a group of World Affairs Council leaders. Jim Falk, one of our speakers today, was also part of that group. We came away with admiration for the ambitious progress that is taking place while recognizing very real issues on many fronts, particularly human rights. So with that, let me introduce today's speakers. Robert Jordan is diplomat in residence in the John G. Tower Center for Political Studies at Southern Methodist University. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 2001 to 2003. He was a partner in the international law firm Baker Botts LLP for many years and headed the firm's Middle East practice based in Dubai until his retirement in 2014. He is vice chair of the Tower Center Board of Directors and the Board of Governors of the Middle East Institute. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Southwestern Medical Foundation, a life member of the Council on Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations, and a past president of the Dallas Bar Association and the Dallas Committee on Foreign Relations. He also serves on the advisory board of the bilateral U.S. Arab Chamber of Commerce. Ambassador Jordan is a frequent commentator with international media, including CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, and the New York Times. His memoir, Desert Diplomat, Inside Saudi Arabia Following 9-11, was published by Potomac Books and is available on Amazon. Jim Falk is President Emeritus of the World Affairs Council of Dallas Fort Worth where from 2001 until 2021, he was its president and CEO. Now living in Santa Fe, he serves on the board of Global Santa Fe, a sister WACA member, and chairs the program committee. Jim's interest in travel and global affairs grew from his year spent in Tunisia, where he attended a French lycee. He is a graduate of Washington and Lee University and earned an MA in foreign affairs at the University of Virginia with a focus on international law and Middle East politics. Jim co-hosts Perspectives Matter, a weekly public affairs program on KERA Dallas. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and an advisory member of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. In 2012, Jim was appointed Honorary Consul for the Kingdom of Morocco. So with that, I present our speakers. Thank you very much. It is such a pleasure to be with you. What, one of the things that I love about the World Affairs Councils is the opportunity to visit such great ones like the, this organization, Colorado Springs, and we had the opportunity uh, among some of the World Affairs Council leaders to be here this past summer, so thank you again for hosting that, and it's a special pleasure to be here with something you didn't mention in that wonderful uh, recognition of Ambassador Jordan is that he was Vice Chair of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. I worked with him but also for him. And let me tell you, he has a smile, but every so often, I know what it's what, like to be a junior foreign service officer in reality. Uh, I may slip and call him Bob, but in no way is that a uh, lack of respect because he was an exceptional ambassador. And something else I'd like to mention is that uh, you, you talked about his work at SMU. I could always call Ambassador Jordan and say, would you come meet with some high school students? or would you talk to our career enrichment seminar, and one of the best ones we ever did 
was when we had Brian Crocker, a career ambassador, one of our best, and Bob Jordan, who was a political appointee, and both of them talking to some 500 students about their separate but distinguished career paths was, was something to behold. And we'll talk a bit about Bob Jordan's experience in, as ambassador. But before we do that, good evening again, sir. Good evening. Is it okay if I call you Jim? You may. Thank right. you. <laughs> <laughs> We're not in Morocco or in Saudi Arabia, so we can do that. Um, you know, the relationship, and oh, I did Carrie and I feel this when we were in Saudi Arabia this past year, late this past year, is it feels like it is so tense at times. And you certainly experienced that when you were ambassador right after 9-11. But it feels different right now. Is it? Probably so. I think you've got to look at it in a continuum. Uh, we have had periods of intense common interest, and we've had periods of intense disagreement, unhappiness, uh, feeling of rejection, paranoia, whatever. So, for example, uh, when King Abdulaziz of Saudi Arabia in 1945 met Franklin Roosevelt on the ship, uh, the USS Quincy, in the Great Bitter Lake of the Suez Canal. They made an arrangement that the Saudis would make oil available to the West and particularly to America at reasonable prices, and America would provide a security umbrella for the Saudis. But also during that meeting, it is said, not documented, but it is said that King Abdulaziz insisted that FDR not support the institution of a homeland for the Jews in Palestine, for the Israelis. <coughs> and FDR supposedly agreed to this. Well, two months later, FDR died. They approached uh, new President Truman about it, and Truman said, I don't know what you're talking about. It ensued that Israel, of course, was recognized by the United Nations uh, the Saudis were furious at this. Uh, a 19-year-old young royal uh, named Faisal, who was the son of Abdulaziz, attended uh, the UN uh, the General Assembly meeting when this occurred. He later became king, and I think continued to uh, be angry at the way the Americans uh, welcomed the Israelis uh, into the land of, in their view, uh, the Palestinians. So we start with that, we go to the Arab oil embargo in the 1970s, we go to 9-11, and there is a seesaw roller coaster ride of the relationship. What we can't tell right now is where are we on that roller coaster ride with what's going on now, but we certainly have reason to be concerned. Uh, we have m more recent, in the eyes of the Saudis, uh, instances of take, either taking them for granted or disregarding the importance of the relationship for other American foreign policy objectives. Under President Obama, they were infuriated by uh, the uh, uh, Iran nuclear deal. They were infuriated by uh, President Obama's interview with the Atlantic Magazine in which he said, uh, that the Saudis need to learn to start sharing the region with Iran, their moral enemy. Uh, that the Saudis had been free riders on American security guarantees over the years. And so you had uh, a, a residual anger building. And even anger from 9-11, oddly enough, the Saudis were angry at America for America's reaction to the fact that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. They said we were being unfair to them by sort of lumping them all in together. So then you go uh, to the Trump era, and while uh, there were close personal relations between uh, President Trump, Jared Kushner, and some of the Saudis, uh, when the Saudis were attacked in 2019, and their oil fields at Atkeg and Grace were attacked, uh, America did nothing. And the Saudis remember that. 
Uh, we actually even removed our Patriot missile batteries and repositioned them elsewhere in the world at that time. You then fast forward to the Biden administration when President Biden was running for office. Uh, as everyone here probably remembers, he said that because of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, the Saudis would be treated as a pariah nation uh, and uh, they would pay a price. Uh, this is something that has also been remembered. President Biden has also vowed to reinstitute the Iran nuclear deal, which by the way is currently dead on arrival, but uh, has certainly again infuriated the Saudis. Uh, and so we now come to the spectacle of uh, President Biden's visit to Riyadh uh, uh, in July. Uh, he goes there after having discouraged American domestic oil production and says to the Saudis, we're having a terrible problem with inflation. Would you mind increasing oil production so that our inflation can go down? And the Saudis look at him like he's crazy. And not only do they not increase oil production, they decrease it by two million barrels a day. What does the uh, uh, White House press secretary say? They say that the Saudis did this on purpose to hurt our effort in defending Ukraine and to hurt Biden and the Democrats in the midterm elections. We can get into the accuracy of those statements, but to describe how the Saudis feel right now about where America is, I think does suggest that we are on one of the lower trajectories that we have been in quite some time. Good overview. Let me ask you this. You, you use the phrase the Saudis, and we often will say the Americans think this, the Saudis think that. Often when you think about how the U.S. is viewed, people will say, well, we love Americans, but we don't like what the American government is doing. Can you make that statement as far as how the man on the street views the United States versus, say, those in the government or in the royal family? Because so many of them, one thing that Karen and I were amazed at uh, was just how many people we met in kingdom, in responsible positions that had gone to the top schools in the United States. Those are not the man on the street. Right. Those are the men in the, those are the, men in the Mercedes. Right. <laughs> And I, I think there is, in, in an autocracy, a monarchy like Saudi Arabia, uh, it's very hard to probe into what the average person on the street thinks because the elites run everything and the man on the street has no voice. And so we as Americans tend to interact with the elites mostly. I would send my foreign service officers out into the boondocks uh, to have tea with the people on the street, to go to the mosque, to listen to the sermons. But in terms of interaction, it was mostly with these elites. And yes, so many of them have had uh, major educational experiences in the United States. Not only that, but before 9-11, we had nonstop direct flights on Saudi Airlines between Riyadh and Orlando so the Saudi kids could go to Disney World. <laughs> we had non-stop flights on Saudi Airlines to Rochester, Minnesota so the older people could go to the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of that blew up after 9-11. But it tells you how many Saudis felt that they were adjunct Americans. They bought into and still buy into American culture American education, and if you look at their Shura Council, which is their consultative council, probably half of them have advanced degrees from the United, St United States educational institutions. Mm -hmm. So the culture is something that is, is rampant. Uh, we used to have jazz concerts at uh, our embassy in Riyadh and also in Jeddah. Uh, they love American culture, uh, and yes, in many ways they detest some of our policies, but the ones who have been educated abroad are uh, nostalgic, I think, for the old days when they felt better about it. And now I think, and we'll transition to this, some of them are now saying maybe we need to go study, start studying Chinese. And a lot of them are. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. 
Uh, I'll just add that, um, and, and certainly you're well aware of this, that the Middle East Institute uses some of the work of the Air Barometer. Um, it's out of Princeton, and uh, they do surveys uh, across the Middle East, Jordan, um, North Africa, Egypt, and they've been unable to conduct surveys yet in the UAE or Saudi Arabia. So Jim Zogby does, but that's about it. Right. Or John Zogby does. But Michael, the air barometer yeah. has, has not been, right. been able to do that yet. <clears throat> now this is an audience that's well informed, but how would you ask, how would you explain if asked, is the relationship with Saudi Arabia worth it? Why should we care? That's a really important question. I think that's something that we need to drill down on here. <clears throat> despite the autocracy, despite the horrific murder of my friend and several of people's friends, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, America has a national interest in maintaining some sort of relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, they are the most robust economy in the Middle East. They control trade routes. They have enormous influence in the Muslim world. Uh, they have uh, become, after some angst, they have become a very important counterterrorism ally. They have actually given us intelligence that has stopped further attacks on our homeland. Uh, they are the strongest bulwark against Iran in the neighborhood uh, and they of course control access to the most important uh, reservoirs and trade in oil uh, uh, in the universe that's a fungible good it, it doesn't uh, make any difference who's consuming what parts of it it's so integral to the world economy as going to be for the next 25 to 30 years and so sometimes you hold your nose sometimes you uh, you try to help improve the situation and I think we have opportunities now to improve what's going on there and they are on a trajectory <coughs> that is overall encouraging despite some of the horrific human rights uh, issues that, that we have just discussed and, and may need to talk some more about. And you talk about this trajectory and we certainly felt it when we were there. You see women driving. Um, they're now allowed to travel abroad without a guardian. And so you have to give some credit to MBS, but you cannot forget the atro atrocities and the violation of human rights. Were you surprised that he ended up with the position that he has, first as Minister of Defense and then Crown Prince and now Prime Minister on top of everything else? Yeah, I was absolutely shocked. When I was ambassador, he was a teenager. He was a young teenager. I probably shook his hand 20 times with his father. I knew his father pretty well. Uh, but I also <coughs> knew his half-brothers, his older half-brothers, much better. And I would have assumed that if they were going to dip down on a vertical sense, historically, the, the throne has been passed around among the direct sons of King Abdulaziz, who died in 1953. And so it's brother to brother to brother. Well, these guys, of course, are dying out. King Salman is pretty much the last of that line. So the question has always been, where would they go next? Would they go to a nephew? Would they go to the next oldest grandson? Or would somehow a son of an existing king become the next king, therefore become the crown prince to start with? And that's exactly what has happened. But I would have thought that if King Salman was going to go to one of his sons, it would have been one of the older sons, three of whom I know fairly well. One, uh, Sultan bin Salman, was a Saudi astronaut. In 1985, he was on the Discovery mission. Uh, I've had wonderful conversations with him. He says, when I'm up there in the space shuttle, looking back down at this little tiny ball called Earth, I wonder, why can't we all get along? He's a wise man. <clears throat> and then there was uh, another son who was uh, an Oxford graduate, a, a, a college professor who took over the family business. And the third son, Abdulaziz bin Salman, is now the Saudi Minister of Petroleum, or Minister of Energy, we call it now. 
Uh, he had been in the Ministry of Petroleum under Ali Al Naimi for many years, and I interacted with him many times. I testified as an expert witness in litigation at his request. He is a really smart guy, but he is uh, diffident. He is phlegmatic. He will go off to Paris for two months at a time in a snit over something. And so I can see where King Solomon would have looked at these three and said, nah, not so sure. And what I think he wanted and what he saw in his second youngest son uh, from his youngest wife was a person who was willing to be ruthless, willing to bring Saudi Arabia into the next century, into the next generation, much as uh, Kemal Ataturk in Turkey or Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, someone willing to use ruthless methods in order to achieve a greater goal. And I think that's what he saw. Well, let's talk about one of those ruthless methods, and that's when several of the princes were invited to go to the Ritz Carlton. Yeah. And that was incredible. Was that really one of the... How was he able to pull that off? Was that really the defining point in his ability to exert power? Uh, it was a defining moment. It's called the Rich Roundup. And uh, uh, basically, two to 250 of the leaders economically of Saudi Arabia, uh, both royals, non royals, uh, oligarchs, billionaires, uh, were all brought in under the pretense of. Oh, remind a, me, when was that? 2017, I believe. And uh, I just stayed in that hotel about two weeks earlier, <laughs> so uh, it was a little odd, but uh, they, they were brought in under pretenses and then uh, basically imprisoned in their hotel rooms, shaken down, some uh, assaulted. There's a story that one of them who was a general actually was tortured and died in the process. Uh, many of them, like uh, Al bin, Prince Awali bin Talal, one of the senior, most senior princes, the head of Kingdom Holding Company, uh, was uh, uh, detained in his room for a long time, lost a great deal of weight, uh, became very gray and pale and wan, and supposedly turned over a large percentage of his empire uh, to either the government or the royal family, depending on how you read it. Uh, and so, yes, this was a, a brutal uh, show. Now, how could it happen? King Salman has been known as probably one of the least corrupt senior royals, one of the ones who was the most concerned about corruption ruining his kingdom, ruining his country, and had already a year or two earlier started an anti-corruption drive, and they had passed some anti-corruption legislation. And so this fit in with it, but as we all know from looking around the world, authoritarians very often use the rubric of countering corruption in order to consolidate their power and minimize their adversaries. And that's China exactly, is a great example of that. Exactly. So that's exactly what's going on here. And he in, indeed pulled it off, partly because of his father's support. And the king is an absolute monarch. And this is not just a king in name only. This is an absolute monarch. And when you have that com uh, combined with the power of, uh, that was invested in the sun, uh, you're able to pull it off. You have the military behind you. You have the Saudi Arabian National Guard, which is the Praetorian Guard protecting the royal family. All of this combined, I think, to make that uh, successful. And by the way, it also helped that the aura of corruption was to some degree correct. Mm -hmm. Not all of these guys were clean. There was a lot of corruption. and. Let's be sure that we have our cultural context uh, in, in place here. What we call corruption in a place like Saudi Arabia was simply a way of doing business. It was the way of the world. Um, they, the royal family, I mean, it, Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world named after a family. And they literally own the country. And so when they think they own the country, Anything goes. They can get a piece of any 
business deal that someone wants, they can come in and say, hey, you're not going to close this unless you give me X. Uh, it, because it's their country. They can get a piece of the military deal. If there's a billion dollar military procurement project, $300 million to some prince is not a big deal. And so there's a lot of that that went on. King Salman was concerned about a lot of that. And so there, there's enough truth to the corruption element of this uh, that I think uh, King Salman was on board. Well, let me move ahead and then we'll come back to this because you practice law uh, in Dubai representing Baker Botts. Has Saudi Arabia been able to move to a form of business where com American companies can feel comfortable investing? Generally, yes. Uh, when I arrived in Saudi Arabia a, a month after 9-11, uh, my concern was that it was uh, rampant with extremism. Its economy was back in the dark ages, again, with this notion of corruption, of kickbacks, uh, exclusive distributorships, and all of that. And it occurred to me that one way to wean them off of this was to make them see that it was in their national interest to join the World Trade Organization. They'd been wanting in, but they weren't really willing to pay the price in terms of revising their legislation, creating a rule of law, creating commercial courts, stopping the Sharia law imposition on businesses. And they needed to join the family of nations, in my view, when they did that, ultimately, they would feel part of the family of nations. They would feel the discipline of international competition, which they couldn't get out of if they're in the WTO. And so we started on this path. And I went to the White House and got Condi Rice and, and uh, Colin Powell and others, uh, the vice president, to support this. And then we went, I went to the U.S. Trade Representative, Bob Zellick, and asked him, in light of the fact that I had everybody lined up against him, <laughs> would he be willing to do this? And the answer was yes. And so by 2005, the Saudis had joined the WTO. They are now part of the G20. They're the 19th largest economy in the world. Uh, and they have provided sufficient protections for foreign direct investment that generally you can feel comfortable going there and doing business there. Again, the human rights uh, footnote to uh, to this expansion is something that is important to note. Uh, it's important to continue to monitor what this Crown Prince, MBS, is up to. But he generally is a visionary. He generally is supportive of foreign direct investment. And they do have a sufficient degree of rule of law now. They've got arbitration regimes. They have uh, ways in which foreign direct investment is protected most of the time. <laughs> Do you feel that the opposition has been totally snuffed out and is there among the Saudi diaspora opposition that could still be viewed as a threat to Mohammed bin Salman? I think it has been largely snuffed out. Uh, one way Jamal Khashoggi was enticed into going to the cons Saudi consulate in Istanbul was because his conversations with a Canadian Saudi uh, were intercepted by the use of Israeli hacking technology that the Saudis had procured. And they were talking about a vast network of opposition uh, to uh, the excesses of the regime. Now, they, they were not talking about revolution. They were not talking about regime change. They were talking about trying to improve the regime, uh, but also talking about their concerns. And that network was penetrated by Saudi intelligence. Uh, and a lot of those people have disappeared uh, and, or have fled. Many have fled Saudi Arabia. But there is not any kind of viable opposition to what's going on now. And I would say that the Crown Prince is enormously popular on the street in Saudi Arabia. He has re revitalized a sense of Saudi nationalism, of Saudi can-do 
We are Saudis, we're proud of it, we're not third class citizens. And this is something that I think has been festering among the Saudi population for quite some time. Well, when we were there, they had just celebrated their national day, which was a new thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the articles that I read was that Saudi Arabia was reticent to pr promote nationalism because they didn't, weren't comfortable overshadowing their responsibility uh, as, a, as the Islamic nation, in a sense. Exactly. <clears throat> there were many things that, that they have done in, in past decades and the last couple of centuries that have been totally focused on being a theocracy. Mm -hmm. And this is striking, striking in the way it has shifted from this. And Mohammed bin Salman is responsible for that. Including defanging the, the religious police. Correct. The religious police have virtually no power now. Uh, women can dress pretty much as they wish, even though modestly. Uh, they can drive, they can get jobs. Uh, the religious police uh, are, to a great degree, a thing of the past. But I wouldn't say that it doesn't mean that the families uh, are losing their uh, affection for and adherence to Islam, mm -hmm. to a fairly conservative version of Islam. But even Muhammad bin Salman has said, we are going back to two or 300 years ago when Islam was a religion of peace. It was not a harsh religion that persecuted people, but it was a religion of peace. Now, <clears throat> historically, that's not entirely accurate because it wasn't all that peaceful 200 years ago. <laughs> but by comparison, I think there's, there's something relevant to what he's saying. I want to go back to the 2019 situation when uh, Iran attacked our eastern oil fields. Uh, as you said, the United States did not come to uh, the kingdom's uh, assistance do you think we should have done something different at that point in time, and what should it have been? I probably would have uh, lobbed some drone Hellfire missiles at the source uh, of the, uh, the attacks. Uh, might have imposed some sanctions further uh, on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but doing nothing, we didn't even do much in way of condemnation. It was sort of like, oh, okay, Quraysh and, and Abkhaz have been attacked. And so I think it, it, was, it was just treated as a non-entity, and I think that to this day infuriates the Saudis. Whose decision was that? A very good question. It had to have been uh, either President Trump uh, uh, or his Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense. And despite some of the criticism of President Trump, one thing that is, has been a consistent theme is he was reluctant to use military force. Correct. Right. Uh, I have to congratulate uh, Ambassador Jordan for coming up with the title for tonight's talk. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about China. Uh, you're, you're the vice chairman, I think, of the Middle East Institute, and just a few days ago they did an incredibly good uh, panel discussion on the relationship of Saudi Arabia and the UA and the GCC with. Uh, China, and Ambassador Charles Freeman, who was ambassador in the early 70s and was still very active at the Middle East Institute, was really very forceful in a sense his criticism of the United States in saying that uh, we're perhaps overreaching and expecting Saudi Arabia just to be our friend and not look to other countries. Uh, is he, is he right? I mean, are we expecting too much of the relationship, especially now? And should we not be so, shall I say, insecure about Saudi Arabia reaching out to other countries? I think Chaz largely is right. Uh, bear in mind that Chaz was not only ambassador to Saudi Arabia, but he was also uh, an envoy to China and was President Nixon's translator when Nixon went to China. So he has a wealth of experience in both domains. Uh, Chaz has said in the past that our relationship with Saudi uh, is one that we really can't get out of. He says it's like a Catholic marriage. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're stuck with each other. Uh, but uh, more seriously, he, uh, I think, correctly observes 
that we view this as a zero-sum game. But you know, guess what? China is Saudi Arabia's largest business customer. Uh, they are literally buy more oil from Saudi Arabia than any other country on the planet. So you know, if you're running a hot dog stand and your best customer wants you to do X, Y, or Z, you're going to do it if you can. And I think we've got to be realistic and understand that we don't buy that much oil from Saudi Arabia anymore. It's like six to eight percent of our oil use. So we conflate sometimes the fact that we view China as a mortal adversary with the fact that China also gets to have relationships around the world. And by the way, so does Saudi Arabia. And one of the things that I learned early on as ambassador was, it's not all about us. Each country has their own national interests. We're there to represent the United States of America, but you've got to understand where the other party's coming from. I learned that as a lawyer as well. When I'm dealing with an adversary, I have to understand what they need, what they want out of whatever the conflict is. And that's where we are exactly today uh, with China. Another thing that the ambassador said, we are asking the GCC to choose between China and the United States, which is pushing these countries to become closer to, to China. But how do we handle the fact that Saudi Arabia is the largest purchaser in the world of weapons? Uh, well, so far we've handled it pretty well because we're selling most of them. <laughs> The, uh, but can they use that as leverage to yes. direct our policies or influence our policies? Well, uh, they really don't direct our policy so much as act as a force multiplier for much of what our policy is. If they weren't buying the weapons from us and we weren't training them on those weapons, we'd be having to use American soldiers and American assets uh, to, to maintain stability in a, an area of the world that is critical to the national, to the worldwide economy uh, and worldwide security. So in many ways, they have been an asset for us. And, and of course, they have also created hundreds of thousands of jobs in the United States uh, through the manufacture of those armaments. Uh, one of the production lines for F-15s at the Boeing plant in St. Louis is almost dedicated uh, to the sale of F-15s uh, to the Saudis. And so <clears throat> this is something that I think we have to take into account. But it's, <clears throat> it's also uh, hard to justify the anger at Saudi Arabia pursuing its own national interests when we have thumbed our nose at them through the repeated slings and arrows that I described earlier. The Iran nuclear deal, it, ad infinitum. Arab-Israeli conflict. Arab-Israeli conflict. And the, and the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is we haven't even had an ambassador in Saudi Arabia since this administration took office. We didn't have an ambassador nominated until April of this past year. He had his confirmation hearing in June, and by the time this Congress expired on January 1st, he still had not been confirmed by the Senate. Same thing with the UAE. And by the way, this is not just a Saudi phenomenon in terms of anger at the United States and the Middle East. The UAE is at least as angry at the United States as the Saudis are for many of the same reasons. Uh, Kuwait, UAE, Kuwait, Saudi have not had ambassadors under this administration. Let me ask you this, Bob. Is that because of uh, some senators' opposition? There are policies in the Middle East, or is it something that we've seen sometimes with Senator Cruz regarding the yeah. Nord Stream uh, uh, 2 pipeline? Uh, there have been one or two senatorial holds put on some of these nominations, but that does not explain why they weren't even nominated until April of this year. Uh, we have just a few more minutes before we open it up to you. Uh, 
when Karen and I last went to the kingdom, it was under the auspices of the Minister of uh, Finance, and we were able to go and see some of these giga projects, including uh, the Red Sea project. And uh, it's all part of Vision 2030, which made me think sometimes that I wish we could have an economic plan like that that would go out in five, ten years. All you need is an autocracy. That's it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people thought we got close to one. But, um, <laughs> How do you view Vision 2030? I mean, it, it, this, this project that we saw at the Red Sea, we saw Hyatt, Rosewood, Fairmont. Um, you think it's going to work? And uh, uh, will it lead to the savvization needed in employment and to help the kingdom move away from uh, uh, oil economy? I think enough of it will work that it will be productive. Uh, it started out in 2016 as a vision that uh, projected that 5% of Aramco would be uh, put up in an IPO that would raise $2 trillion. Uh, then they started thinking about the disclosures they would have to make if they were going to launch an IPO. And what were the regulators and what were the underwriters insist on in terms of disclosure? They ended up coming forward with a much more modest IPO, which was successful. Uh, and I think there's a grandiosity uh, to the project. It was, a lot of it was drafted by McKinsey and Company, and apologies to any McKinsey people who might be here tonight, but they've sold similar projects uh, throughout the world, <laughs> much of the Middle East, as yeah, their, their Vision 2020, 2075, whatever it is. Uh, but it, I don't want to denigrate it in this sense. The ambition, uh, the enthusiasm it has kindled among the population has solidified, I think, the population in a really important and positive way. Uh, Saudis are proud to be Saudis right now, and they're looking at these projects. The risk is, of course, that they will fail miserably in some of the big projects, which will become white elephants. And literally, the investment world was calling them white elephants mm -hmm. uh, for some period of time. Uh, so we don't know how successful, ultimately, certain projects, mega projects, will be. But the notion of expanding their population and their economy into the more desirable parts of Saudi Arabia, namely the, the northwest coast, up toward Aqaba uh, and down south toward Jeddah uh, is, is striking. And it is probably doable, but it also further explains why, the expense of it explains partly why, again, the Saudis insisted on not increasing the production of oil at Biden's request, because they, in order to meet their budget, have to have the oil revenue that a robust price for oil uh, dictates for their budget. They have run a budget deficit every year for the last six or seven years. They can't keep that up. And so they've got, they've got to make their, uh, their, their goal. Diplomats in the United States and in Saudi Arabia now often describe the relationship as transactional. Is that so bad? Uh, uh, it could be better. I, I think they deserve better and we deserve better. And I said, that, by the way, I said this to President Bush when I was in office 20 years ago. Um, we have failed to have a long-term vision of what this relationship needs to be. Ergo, we have no ambassador. We don't seem to care enough to have an ambassador. And we don't seem to care enough to sit down and, and have a planning session with the Saudis on where this relationship needs to go. Where do you factor China into it? What is China giving them that we should be giving them but we don't seem to care enough to do? Uh, these, are, these are hard questions we have to ask. Uh, but the, if we walk away from this relationship, then the Chinese get to say what they want to say and they get to dictate the terms of the relationship. Uh, there was a really interesting article in Foreign Policy magazine uh, a few weeks ago 
in which a young Saudi says, he's actually, he says, I came to Disneyland as a kid. I love America. I was educated in America. One of the things I loved was Christmas. And I loved the Christmas story, the Charles Dickens Christmas story of Ebenezer Scrooge. And I'm thinking now about when Scrooge is shown Christmas of the future without Santa Claus and without Christmas and everyone is uh, starving and they're having a, a, a terrible uh, future. And he says, I don't want that to be what happens if China is our main relationship. I don't want the Chinese to be deciding what goes on and lose the, the traction with America. And so there, there is a, a bit of cultural uh, nostalgia there that I think uh, needs to be recognized. Questions from you? Thank you so much to both of you for your comments. So we are going to um, bring the microphone, Masha is going to actually take charge of this, but I am going to take this off. Um, I did have a question, but Jim stole it. I want to test it. <laughs> <time for you. laughs> he does that. But I, I have received one question from um, our membership electronically, and so it's a little bit of a niche question, but I'll ask it anyway, and then we'll open it up to everybody else. How can the Saudi, how can the U.S. justify the Saudis as well as other countries taking our water resources? Wells are running dry because of the over-irrigation for alfalfa crops in Arizona. Compounding this is the allotment of the Colorado River water is getting cut by 21% to the state. Alfalfa is one of the most water resource intensive crops to grow at 325,848 gallons per acre per year. As we literally see the aquifer levels drop, data suggests that the average Arizona farmer is paying six times the amount the Saudis are for the water to grow the crops. Should the residents of Arizona, <coughs> citizens of the U.S., for that matter, have to subsidize the Saudis to grow alfalfa at the expense of our water supplies? There was a long article in the New York Times or this past week about that. Yeah. I don't have much of an answer. I do know that the Saudis tried to grow wheat on their own uh, 20 years ago. And the cost in water resources of growing the wheat was more than the wheat could be sold for once it was grown. And so they abandoned it. Um, maybe we need to start treating uh, water resources as critical infrastructure, just like we treat roads and bridges and other things like that, and uh, and take a look at it. But I don't have a very good answer for it. Well, one thing that Bob and I both know about World Affairs Council audiences, you generally have lots of questions, so please go up to the mic, or I might ask one or two more. Go ahead, Sky. I'm gonna, uh, thank you both for being here, Ambassador. It's Wonderful to get your personal reflections on your own experience there. And Jim, we know you know that part of the world quite well as well. Uh, I love your story about the Christmas future, but you didn't. It, that story didn't go where I thought it was gonna go. You earlier said maybe 25, 30 years, Saudi oil is the dominant venture. Maybe it's 50 years, but what Christmas future without a global dependence on oil, whenever that is, yeah. what does Saudi Arabia become? And are they even thinking about that possibility? Because the Saudi, as you know, Saudi Arabia before the discovery of oil was virtually irrelevant in global politics. And it may be, that, I mean, the Chinese won't be interested, the rest of the world may not be interested. So what is your sense of their perspective on that Christmas future? Uh, Sky, the answer to that is Vision 2030. Uh, there is uh, a hugely detailed section in uh, the documentation uh, focusing on developing uh, non-hydrocarbon sources of energy within Saudi Arabia. So they have already consulted with South Korea uh, and I think China on a nuclear capacity. Uh, they're talking about building 16 nuclear reactors. Uh, they are working on wind and solar technology in the desert. 
and the solar technology has been impeded by the dust that gathers on the solar panels. Recently, they claim to have found a way to keep those panels clean uh, or to clear them so that they can uh, receive the rays of the sun. Similar to some of the cleaning of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which is the world's tallest building. And I lived there when it was going up and saw it and lived with it after it was built. And they managed to keep that surface pristine. And so there are, there are alloys or whatever that they're working on on that. So the, the, the short answer is they are uh, passionately aware of and scared to death of the end of, the, uh, of demand uh, for oil. <clears throat> There's a famous saying from uh, one of the previous Saudi oil ministers that the stone age did not end because of a lack of stones. And the oil age will not end because of a lack of oil. But they would like to be responsible for selling the last drop. <laughs> um, I understand we're talking about Saudi Arabia and China, but I've been interested in some thoughts of where Saudi is at with its relationship with Israel. The Abraham Accords have been taken up by at least two of the, two of the uh, Emirate countries. Uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia have a common enemy. And I, I don't quite understand it, but I think there's Saudi is looking at something of Jordan called the Hashemite Kingdom that may include the Palestinians. Can you give some background on that? Yeah, that's a very important question. You know, when I arrived in Saudi Arabia after 9-11, I was trying to figure out how could it be that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. And so I went to see Prince Salman, who was governor of Riyadh at the time, of course now he's king. And I asked him that question, and he said, oh no, no, there were no Saudis responsible for 9-11. This was an Israeli plot. The Israelis did this to drive a wedge between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Well, of course, I couldn't believe my ears. So then I went to see the Minister of uh, 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 Intelligence, Prince Nayef, uh, and he gave me the same answer. And all, I, all I'm saying by that is, in those days, the greatest enemy the Saudis saw was Israel. They were responsible for everything bad in the world. Now it's Iran. And so they now have common cause with Israel in resisting the regional mayhem that is being inflicted uh, by Iran. This is really important. They have been doing business with each other quietly for years. The Israelis have sold night vision equipment, they have sold intelligence, they, they've sold the hacking equipment that got Jamal Khashoggi killed, uh, Israeli technology. The Abraham Accords were a massive breakthrough and the UAE signed, Morocco signed, Sudan signed, and Bahrain signed. Bahrain would never have signed that without Saudi permission. Bahrain is basically a client state of Saudi Arabia. And so it, it, that was the tell for me, that the Saudis quietly are endorsing this. And it is mainly the opposition of King Salman that is keeping them right now from signing up. And why is that? That's because the Abraham Accords have nothing in them for the Palestinians. It's as if the Palestinians don't exist. And in a way you can understand that the Arab world, the Arab monarchies, are fed up with Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinians. He's shown no leadership, total corruption, no ability to get any kind of deal done whatsoever. Now we have a very hard right militant Israeli <coughs> government that is even less inclined to give any quarter to the Palestinians. And in fact, we have a cabinet member going to the Temple Mount uh, totally aghast in the Arab world. I think that's a risk to the Abraham Accords. 
I think this Israeli government, is, and Netanyahu is going to have his hands full hurting these cats in his cabinet because they may well blow up the Abraham Accords by the militants uh, that we're seeing here. But the, the real game right now for the, for the Saudis is to maintain some sort of constancy in the relationship with Israel. The Abraham Accords are a lot more popular among the government leadership than the man on the street. And if you probably were to take a, to take a poll on the street in Saudi Arabia, 90% of the population would say, nah, uh, these are Israelis, we're not gonna do that. One thing I was gonna say, Ambassador, is when you looked at the World Cup, yeah. it wasn't just Saudi Arabia or the Kingdom of Morocco, it really turned out to be like people were, it was a, a call to force for the Palestinians. Yeah. And back to the Arab Barometer, and you can go to the Arab Barometer website, I don't remember the URL, but just type in Arab Barometer, uh, you will see that the polls in Jordan and Egypt um, and, and other countries where the polls have been taken, that the man on the street is very now very much uh, inclined to be against the Abraham Accords. Yeah. Other, yes sir. Wayne Artis from Pikes Peak State College. Would you speak to Saudi Arabia's involvement in the war and civil war in Yemen? and what effect that has had on its relationship with not just the United States, but the international community as well. Uh, the, the Saudis have had a long, long history of conflict with the Houthi groups, multiple tribes uh, in Yemen. Uh, they've had border skirmishes for years, I can recall uh, King Salman saying to me one time that he was convinced that uh, they were uh, sending drugs across the country into Saudi Arabia, perhaps to corrupt the population, but also uh, as a means of uh, gaining revenue uh, for what they were doing. So there's been animosity there for many, many years. The Houthis were finally fed up with the government the Saudi-sponsored government in Sana'a and rebelled. They marched on Sana'a. Uh, the new president of Yemen, who followed Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, ran away and ran to Riyadh. The Houthis took over Sana'a, and they were sort of like the dog that caught the bus. They didn't quite know what to do. They had been getting minor support from Iran by this point, but not massive support. And they were not, at least at that time, literally proxies of Iran. They were uh, pretty independent, and they had some friction with Iran. And they weren't literally uh, Shia, uh, religious uh, adherents either. They were off offshoots. Well, Iran sees what uh, the Houthis have done, and they say, hey, this is a pretty good idea for us to help the Houthis here. This is going to really drive the Saudis nuts. And, uh, and so they start pumping uh, advisors, technology, uh, showing them how to uh, build Scud missiles and ultimately providing uh, even more sophisticated uh, armaments. Uh, and the Saudis by 2015 are saying, this is a serious security threat for us. And so uh, Crown Prince uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman launches uh, air attacks uh, on the Houthis and their positions. Now, trying to win a war in Yemen is sort of like trying to win a war in Afghanistan. You can't do it by air power, but that's pretty much what the Saudis did with American help. And the Americans provided uh, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance. We provided mid-air refueling and we provided munitions. We provided JDAMs, which are the computer-assisted smart bombs, as well as just a lot of more crude bombs. And one of the problems was, in order to drop a JDAM or a similar uh, missile on a target with precision, you have to fly around 10,000 feet or lower. Saudi pilots didn't much want to do that. 
30,000 was a lot more comfortable for them. <laughs> and what does that lead to? That leads to massive civilian casualties. And so they were basically carpet bombing the Houthis, uh, leading to <clears throat> the world's largest humanitarian catastrophe, massive starvation, uh, and a complete uh, humanitarian atrocity. Uh, finally, uh, the uh, Americans decide to no longer provide uh, mid-air refueling, as if somehow that was going to stop it. Uh, but it didn't stop it. And so that uh, continues to this day. The Houthis have taken more territory. The UAE was initially a partner with the Saudis in the campaign, but they have seen uh, that it's to, in their view, uh, hopeless. And so what they're trying to push now is a partition of Yemen in which the South is essentially under UAE rule. And by the way, they've been building naval bases and ports all along the Red Sea uh, as a consequence of their access uh, to that territory. So it, it, they had a ceasefire that expired in October and has, uh, has not been reinstituted. Uh, the conflict continues. Uh, uh, Tim Lender King uh, has been the U.S. envoy there doing a terrific job, but there isn't much that can be done to convince the Saudis to stop, and the Houthis are now feeling their oats, and they're not much interested in compromising either, and Iran is saying this is great. What's the status of the use of U.S. weapons? Uh, they, well, we're, <coughs> we're still providing munitions, uh, and you know, you, you've got to look at it in this way as well. This is, this is a security threat to Saudi Arabia. They have, the Houthis, as we were saying earlier, uh, attacked the, uh, the Saudi oil fields. Uh, they also attacked the UAE. They, they did some real damage in Abu Dhabi, uh, near the airport in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so there is uh, a security threat out there. Uh, and we, it, it's, if we cease to provide some, any, some kind of support to the Saudis and the Emiratis in this conflict, I think we would be seen as turning our back uh, even uh, worse than we have already. We'll get you next, sir, with the microphones in the back. Sorry about that. Uh, just wanted to echo the appreciation for your presence here today. It's very insightful. My question concerns <clears throat> American-Saudi relations with regards to the petrodollar and how the latest summit with China and Saudi Arabia has pushed for the Saudis to sell oil in yuan rather than the yeah. USD. Uh, what kind of implications would you think that this holds as far as other Gulf states potentially moving away from the petrodollar and what that would do for American interests in the region? During my time as ambassador, the oil minister was Ali al Naimi, sort of legendary. Uh, and he kept reminding me that one of the benefits we got out of the relationship was the Saudis were selling their oil in dollar denominated transactions. Their currency, the Saudi Riyadh, is also pegged to the dollar, fixed uh, 3.75 to the dollar. And <clears throat> if we cease to be a reserve currency around the world. Uh, the United States uh, loses enormous uh, soft power uh, in, in the world, and it loses enormous economic power. If they continue to engage in oil transactions uh, in uh, the WAN, or the RMB, whatever you want to call it, it is potentially a slippery slope to China becoming not the, but maybe a reserve currency in the world, or at least part of a basket of currencies. And I think this has long-term serious implications for the United States. But on the other hand, what's the alternative? And I think we're, one of the things we're going to have to recognize is that China is going to have economic power, they're going to use it, uh, and this is one of the examples of how that's going to happen. And what we have to be ready to do on every front, not just Saudi Arabia, but every front we can think of, is to compete where we can 
and recognize sometimes we can't compete. And right now, in, we, we can't be the largest purchaser of oil for Saudi Arabia anymore. So where are they going to go? Uh, one of the things we can do is produce more domestic oil right now, uh, which we're going to need for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, this is an area where we can at least help impact the worldwide price of oil by our own production. But we've simply got, we can't tell the Saudis, don't sell oil to China. And so China <clears throat> will make every effort to engage in as many transactions around the world in their own currency as they possibly can. And what we have to do is, is flange up our, our relationships, our, our alliances with NATO, with Asia, Japan, South Korea, uh, so that the Chinese would be isolated in any attempt to uh, engage in their denominated transactions the best we can. But it's not going to be pretty. <clears throat> I think you mentioned that the uh, Saudis were opposed to the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Why is that? Well, for, first of all, it caused us to release $150 billion of Iranian money that had been frozen in the United States. Where did that money go? It went mostly to efforts to destabilize Gulf Monarch, the Gulf monarchies, uh, Iraq, uh, other areas in which uh, Iran exercises malign influence uh, throughout the region. Uh, this was abhorrent uh, to the Saudis and really all the Gulf monarchies as well. Uh, secondly, it had a short uh, tail on its duration. In fact, it would be expiring. If, if we hadn't bailed out of it, it would be expiring in the next very few years anyway. Uh, third, it had uh, virtually no teeth to the inspection regime that it purported to uh, embrace. Uh, it didn't also uh, remotely address uh, any sanctions uh, for the malign activities. It was simply uh, a relief of sanctions on the nuclear uh, development part of it. Uh, and so it was, it was really a, a in many ways a toothless uh, exercise. I think the Obama administration in good faith thought that if it was adopted and adhered to, and, and Iran did adhere to it uh, in, until uh, the Trump administration withdrew, but if they adhered to it, maybe with some luck, Iran would become less of a, a malignant power uh, in the region. They would feel more inclined to soften uh, their resistance economy, their resistance, their, their revolutionary zeal uh, in uh, insinuating themselves throughout the region. Well, that, that didn't happen either. So the benefits didn't occur, and the detriment in the 150 billion and others, at least I think in the eyes of, of most of the Middle Eastern countries and, and Israel, uh, uh, was, was a real negative. Um, you've, talk, you've talked a lot about uh, uh, Iran and uh, the surrounding areas. Uh, does Iran have any influence in Africa? I didn't hear a word about Africa. I know it's mostly yeah. about China, but uh, one, maybe one question about Africa. Yeah, they have, act they have activities in Africa. And by the way, they also have uh, activities in South America. A lot of people don't realize they are uh, in the Western Hemisphere as well. And they are out there uh, destabilizing governments, uh, uh, expanding uh, their militias uh, in, in many, uh, many countries that I don't think are on the headlines. And to support to Russia. Correct. And they're supporting Russia. They're providing drones to Russia uh, to use in Ukraine. Uh, Roland Rainey, one of the council members uh, here. Uh, one of the questions I had is the General Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, I think it was Resolution 68-262, the uh, territory integrity of Ukraine going in that direction. Uh, Saudi was a major supporter of that uh, resolution. Now, however, Russia definitely exports a lot of refined fuels to Saudi. 
I wanted to see if you can talk a little bit about the Saudi-Russia relationship and how does that look now with the engagements that are going on out there. Yeah, and that, <clears throat> that's a great question and it's a really complicated uh, answer. <clears throat> Um, the the Saudi-Russian relationship has sort of been on again, off again. They the they are business partners in OPEC Plus. OPEC was about to become irrelevant because the Russians were not part of it. And you may recall there was a price war between the Russians and the Saudis a few years ago. In fact, uh, during the, Trump, the early part of the Trump administration, Donald Trump threatened the Saudis that if they didn't cut their production so that the price of oil would go up, American oil producers would go bankrupt. And it's ironic in a way that we were now finding ourselves asking them to increase production so the price would go down. <laughs> but so they were bitter adversaries with Russia in this price war. The Russians finally decided they couldn't keep up the price war, and so they basically decided to join forces and create OPEC Plus. And so now they have unified enough of the world's oil production to actually have an impact on price worldwide. The, the Saudis, of course you may recall, in the 1980s uh, were instrumental with the United States in throwing the Russians out of Afghanistan. Uh, this was where Osama bin Laden got his start, was a joint U.S.-Saudi effort to repel Russia from Afghanistan. It has been a a, a, a sort of a, again, a roller coaster ride between those two countries in terms of how they would relate to each other. But it's, it's transactional. It, it, it's certainly not ideological. Uh, and so if they, if they can engage in these kinds of transactions back and forth, uh, it's to their advantage. And I think we've got to remember that the Saudis and even the Russians to some degree view oil and gas as their crown jewels they don't have anything else. Uh, they, they still, in many ways, are a gas pump in the Middle East. And if there's anything that is tampering with it, including, by the way, American-supported buyer cartels that are talking about capping Russian oil prices at $60 a barrel, this is something that the people who view the crown jewels and are responsible for those crown jewels are really going to get exercised about. And so that uh, it, they have enough in common on enough issues to have a relationship. It's not ideological, uh, and I, I don't think they admire each other particularly, but I think they are business partners and will be for some time. Gentlemen. My name is Darwin, thank you guys for coming. Um, so, you guys, the, the way that I understand the US and Saudi Arabia relationship is a transactional one, insofar as they provide us oil and we provide them security. Now, given our recent and very public failure in Afghanistan, as well as our seemingly very ill-timed withdrawal of Patriot and Thad batteries in that same year, it seems that we're not holding a bargain with the bar. Right? So my question goes back to the title of tonight, and it's why do they even care about continuing this relationship with us, and why wouldn't they go get their security needs met elsewhere, like China? Thank you. That's a great question, and actually one of the articles that we've seen come out here in the last couple of weeks makes that exact point. The, the young man, and I think it was in foreign policy that I was describing earlier about Christmas and so forth, was also saying, what are we getting out of this relationship now with the United States? And isn't it true that we are likely to get more from China? Because here they come in. When Xi Jinping came to Riyadh on October the 8th, they ended up signing memorandums of understanding for $50 billion worth of business transactions. 
Now, maybe less than half of those will actually become real, but some of them sure will. And how many summit meetings like that have we had where we've had deliverables anywhere like that uh, on the American side? <coughs> Biden goes to, China, to Riyadh in July to get help on inflation with the midterms. <clears throat> I was talking with a New York Times reporter who had been in Riyadh during that time. And I said, where were the deliverables? What was the deliverable? And he turns to me and says, the deliverable was Biden. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, we have somehow failed to act like the relationship's important. We, we have failed to capitalize on the massive business infrastructure that we could be providing to them. And so who's going to fill that vacuum? Well, Chinese have come in very deftly and have done so. But I think we've also got to recognize that this Chinese relationship uh, between the Saudis and the Chinese has existed for many, many years. Um, when King Abdullah became king in 2005, his first trip abroad was to China. He directed Aramco to send dozens of their employees to learn Chinese language and negotiation skills uh, from the Chinese. The Chinese have visited or had summit meetings with the Saudis about every three or four years since then. They have come up with multiple periods of massive infrastructure construction. I can recall even when I was there uh, 20 years ago, <clears throat> they created what was called the Saudi Land Bridge, and that is a coast-to-coast -coast railroad, a commercial railroad that's a transport oil from the eastern province where it's explored and, and developed and pumped by rail cars uh, to the west coast for then export to Europe uh, or Asia. Uh, using all Chinese facilities, rails, cars, and by the way, when the Chinese do business with you, they don't hire your employees, your citizens, they bring their own in. So they bring in 747s full of Chinese laborers who work at slave wages to build whatever infrastructure projects they're building. And this is how they get their hooks in you. And so they've had their hooks in the Saudis in a progressive way for at least the last 20 years, if not longer, and now it's becoming larger, and now it is taking on a security dimension because now they're talking about mutual security cooperation. This is not something the Chinese have ventured into in the past, but the, the, and this may be a signal to the U.S., but every now and then the Chinese will sell the Saudis arms that the U.S. refuses to sell. Back in the 1980s, Congress refused to sell fighter planes to the Saudis, and they went out and bought CSS-2 Chinese missiles. They're now talking about CSS-4, or whatever the latest Chinese missile model is. And so there, there are times when the Chinese are selling hardware that doesn't have to be interoperable with the constellation of Patriots and F-15s and so forth that we normally sell to them. And I think we're going to start seeing perhaps more of that interoperability degraded uh, by more hardware sales, more military sales from the Chinese. Underscoring what you said, again, Ambassador Friedman recently said China's visit um, was really old wine in a new bottle, and that we have not been perhaps as acutely aware that we should yeah. be about the strength of that relationship. Exactly. Yep. We're almost out of time, and I wanted to ask you one question, and I hope you won't take offense. Um, in your book, you talk about how you were one of the first people to learn about um, the U.S. invasion to Iraq that it was going to take place. Mm -hmm. 21 years later, 22 years later, mm -hmm. how do you look back to that day and our invasion of Iraq? I look back with regret. Uh, I think we all in good faith at that time believed that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, uh, likely not nuclear. I think maybe some people overplayed the threat of a nuclear attack, uh, but certainly chemical and biological. I saw uh, in top secret intelligence reports 
uh, of interceptions of communications between uh, Iraqi officers saying to each other, be sure you have your gas mask ready because when the fighting starts, you're going to need it. Things like that. Uh, I think it was naive to believe that we would be greeted with flowers and bouquets uh, by the Iraqi people when we were turning their country upside down. Uh, I think it was, not, it was worse than naive for our pro-consul, uh, Jerry Bremer, to disband the Ba'ath Party, disband the Iraqi military, and send these new, hundreds of thousands of newly unemployed soldiers home with their weapons. Uh, these are people who could have been productively co-opted, I think, uh, into helping rebuild uh, Iraq. And we, as, as the Saudi foreign minister said to me after the invasion, he said, Ambassador, you have now handed Iraq to Iran on a silver platter. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways that's what we did. We created a vacuum. Iran filled the vacuum to the credit of many Iraqis, they have resisted Iran completely taking over the country. There is a glimmer of hope that they will remain a semblance of independence from incursions from either the Iran or the West and try to build their own uh, sense of nationalism. But I basically look back with regret as to how it played out. Thank you, sir. So I want to just encourage everyone to pick up, if you can, through an order on Amazon, the ambassador's book. You'll find it really a, a wonderful description of his service to our country and to what happened immediately after 9-11. Yeah. So we have about three minutes left, and I'm going to let one last question in. So, Ambassador, again, thank you for being here. Very enlightening. Um, you had mentioned this, and I know the Saudis are very proud of giving women the right to um, drive, which pulls them up to about 100 years behind the rest of the <laughs> yeah. Western world. Right. Um, and, you know, their love of Disneyland is, is, is quite cute, but I suspect half of, the, um, half of the population of the United States, which are women, are still a bit skeptical, and, you know, Saudis fighting a PR problem, uh, thus, things like the live tour. Can you talk a little bit about that, that issue and um, is it something they can overcome? I'm glad you raised that question. Uh, I think we've got to be careful to not be deluded into thinking that there's some progressive uh, vision going on here other than uh, what is probably a calculated idea of how to get popular support for the regime. It is very clear, as evidenced by the number of protesters in jail, including a lot of women who agitated for the right to drive, who are still incarcerated, some of them are under house arrest, some of them are in prison, that this crown prince believes that he is not recognizing the rights of these people, he is simply dispensing privileges to them which he can rescind at the drop of a hat. And I think that's something the live tour and the golf live tour, which for those of you who haven't followed it, uh, has failed to recognize. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's still a serious concern that we, the international community needs to have. We need to continue to uh, press to ventilate, to publicize, and to remind the Saudis, especially the Crown Prince, uh, of what international values really are and what human rights really are. And that a cosmetic whitewashing by a golf tour or letting women drive or some shiny new buildings on the Red Sea aren't going to do it. It has been such a pleasure and an honor to have both of you. Thank you, Ambassador Jordan and Jim Paul.
that we like to give to our speakers. We have one for each of you. This is our Wilbur's Sky and Safety Covenant code. It's Colorado Springs World Affairs Council logo. Thank you. Paperweight, so we're happy to present this Wonderful. to you. See you on my next right. Zoom call. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, well, help me to thank these two gentlemen.